Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Thursday, June 16th, 2011, and our special guest tonight is Denise Pope from Stanford on her book, Doing School, How We Are Creating a Generation of Stressed Out, Materialistic, and Miseducated Students. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You're suffering a little bit from allergies, I know. I am. I'm sorry. It's so funny. I grew up on Stanford campus and uh-huh. didn't have allergies till I moved to Sacramento. So we, in Sacramento, we sort of think of Stanford as being kind of Shangri-La, that nobody gets allergies. <laughs> well, I don't usually suffer from allergies, but apparently it's a very bad season. And we just had graduation, and I looked down at my gown, and it was covered with yellow pollen. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Future of Education is sponsored by Blackboard Collaborate, what used to be Wimba and Illuminate now combined, are releasing a new platform this summer, uh, Blackboard Collaborate. The project I work on is Learn Central, the social network for educators. The show is also sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project, uh, web20labs.com. We have started the Teacher 2.0 network. This is a lot of fun. It's different than our Classroom 2.0 network. This is really about personal and professional growth for educators using the web. Uh, We have our first workshop tomorrow, actually in my backyard, or or close to where I live. I'm holding an experimental all-day workshop. There's still time to come. You don't even need to let us know. But at teacher20.com, you'll find the information. Uh, We have announced yesterday the library 2.011 2.011 virtual conference, a two-day, multiple time zone, worldwide conference. It is free. Library2011.net that's being held in conjunction with San Jose State University's School of Library and Information Systems. And we're delighted that they're um, involved. And we had a huge response in the last two days to the announcement of that conference. So we're very excited about it, November 2nd and 3rd. Coming up on November 14th to 18th, our second Global Education Conference, five days of pure fun, 24 hours a day, 36 time zones. We'll have hundreds and hundreds of sessions from dozens of countries. If you didn't join us last year, uh, do plan on joining us this year, globaleducationconference.com. Coming up next week, hard to believe it's so quickly, but next Saturday is EduBloggerCon. That's the all-day unconference held before the ISTE uh, conference. EduBloggerCon is free uh, thanks to ISTE. You don't even need to be registered for ISTE to come to EduBloggerCon. It's at the Pennsylvania Convention Center, June 25th, Saturday, 8 to 5 p.m. More details at EduBloggerCon.com. It is an unconference, so be prepared to come and have fun. Also, at ISTE, we have the Bloggers Cafe. And we have ISD Unplugged, which is filling fast. Uh, this is a wiki where you can actually sign yourself up to present at ISD. Uh, it's been really popular this year. That's at ISTEUnplugged.com. We're taking a little bit of a break in the show, but July 5th, Sandy Hirsch from San Jose State University will be on to talk about libraries and digital literacy. Sandy's my co, um, co-chair of the Library 2.011 conference. Then on July 7th, Carol Black on her fascinating movie, Schooling the World. Denise, I, don't, I wonder if you've seen this. Have you seen that movie? I have not seen Schooling the World. It's about the exporting of Western style education uh, to third world countries, in particular northern India. It's a very interesting show. Uh, we're we're going to follow that up on August 4th with uh, Jim Mayfield who does humanitarian work around the world to talk about uh, lessons in self-determination and the the different ways of thinking about education and schooling as part of humanitarian work and as part of uh, non-Western technologies. On July 14th, the authors of Educating for Global Competence come on. Uh, Tony Jackson is um, CEO, I think, of Asia Society, or the president of Asia Society. Should be a lot of fun. Anyway, lots of fun coming up. Doug Rushkoff back on the show on August 9th. Howard Gardner on September 15th. Um, Sam Chaltain again back on the show on September 15th. If you've missed any of our shows, they are all recorded. They're in full Illuminate versions online and also in MP3 portable audio format. 
Uh, we talked this week to Larry Ferlazzo about helping students motivate themselves. Really, I really love his book uh, and recommend that interview if you get a chance. So futureofeducation.com has all of the recordings. Troy Hicks talked to us about why digital writing matters. Uh, we have the authors of The Invisible Gorilla on. We had Cal Newport on to talk about high school superstars, and he's actually going to come up in this interview. So yeah. if you found that an interesting book, uh, oh, I'm glad you said something. Denise, do you, are you familiar with his work? I know Cal, yes. He, he emailed me a couple years ago. We've been email buddies. Oh, good. Well, I've got a question about that, so I'm, I'm delighted that you know about it. If this is your first time at Illuminate, it is a participative environment, so we hope that you will find ways to participate. Uh, look for the emoticons at the bottom of your participant window. There's a smiley face, a clapping hand, a confused look or a thumbs down. Welcome to use any or all of those, although we appreciate the smiley face and the clapping hand the most. There is an icon with a hand and a green up arrow that says if you'd like to ask a question and we'll give you the microphone. If you do think you'll ask a question with a mic, it's good to go up to tools, audio, and the audio setup wizard to make sure your mic is working. Um, I find it much easier to follow the chat if I change the layout of my screen. You do that by going up to View Layouts and switch to the Wide Layout. So it's View Layouts and switch yourself to the Wide Layout. So right now I'm going to give you permissions to modify the whiteboard so that you can indicate where you're listening from, those of you who are on live. Look for the wand. It's the blue stick with the red star at the end. Click on that and then click on the map, and it leaves a little dot. It's also fun if you do a shout out in the chat. Let us know uh, where you're listening from and maybe the time and the temperature or any other interesting information. Maybe the pollen count. Right, <laughs> the pollen count. <laughs> I'm kidding. This is, this is a this is an interesting, uh, uh, this is a rare night when we don't have um, um, folks from around the world. We look like that we look to be a U.S. only audience tonight. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's also end of school year. I don't know what's going on in, in uh, the southern hemisphere, but as always, we really appreciate your attending. Oh, we do have someone from Melbourne. Good. Croatia. Hey, check that out. Wow. Okay, so we are glad to have you listening. And if you're listening to the recording, thanks for taking the time and, and allowing us to get through that kind of business material. So, Denise, I have just one thing to say to you. Since, since I did grow up on the Stanford campus and I looked at you, somewhere I saw your schedule for the summer. I saw that you were going to Stanford Sierra Camp, and it just made me jealous as all get out. Oh, I know. It's such a good gig. This is the second time <laughs> that I'll be there. My kids love it, and I love it. It's it's beautiful. Do you still do the Wednesday to Wednesday? Yes, that's exactly uh, right. I, well, I grew up going because my dad was dean of admissions at Stanford, and so we would go every Your dad is Fred. Or something. My dad what? is Fred. Your dad admitted me. <laughs> oh, what a fun connection. He's terrific. Yeah, that's fun because, uh, of course, with Cal Newport, a lot of this came up because he mentioned Stanford and Princeton a lot in his book. Yeah. And, um, um, and, I, and so I have this sort of unique history of being involved vicariously in all of that. Uh, but I actually also went to Stanford and worked at Sierra Camp uh, one summer. So very, very fun memories for me. Fun. Um, okay, so would you give us a little bit of the background? This is not a new book. Um, are you? Can you? I mean, you've probably told the story a, a billion times, but we'd love to, I'd love to hear a little bit about sort of what brought you to the book and in your own um, sort of uh, career, and uh, and what kind of a response you've had to the book since then. Sure. So I was a high school English teacher, right out of a master's of education program, and I had the lowest level kids at a kind of medium public school um, and realized that I had no idea. I had 175 kids that I was responsible for, a lot of paper grading, and I realized that I had no idea how they were really experiencing school. I, I saw them for these little 45-minute windows of time. And when I uh, went to graduate school several years later, 
and we had to pick a subject for our dissertation, I said I was very interested in the student's experience of school reform. And my professor looked at me and he said, we don't even really know the student's experience of school, let alone school reform. Why don't you do a study where you figure that out? And I was trained in qualitative research, which means I did a very small, in-depth study. So I had five students and I shadowed them for the school year. And, and really, I was interested in engagement, which is I'm still, it's still one of my main uh, research interests, which is how do we get kids excited about what they're learning, motivated, um, you know, to see the value and see how it relates to them. And I went into what was considered a really good public school, and I found, you know, I asked counselors and administrators and whatnot for kids who were doing relatively well, who were who they would say were engaged in school. And it could be engaged in school because they were a top sports player. It didn't have to be academically engaged. And then um, I followed these kids, and what I realized was, you know, these kids had really good grades. They were definitely involved in school. But in their words, they were doing school. They were so overloaded with stress. Some were taking you know, six AP classes at a time. Some were not taking any AP classes, but the rest of their life um, you know, encroached, as it always does. One of them had a sick mother. One of them didn't speak English. One of them had test anxiety. And I realized that looking at how kids are engaged in school, you have to really take a much closer look and say, what's going on inside and out of school uh, with some fabulous teachers and some not so fabulous teachers that makes these kids take the actions that they do. So that's sort of the background to the book. And then what happened is, um, so it was my dissertation, and I was encouraged to publish it. And, and people started to read it, and the, the, the person in charge of mental health at Stanford called me into his office and he said, you know, we have the aftermath of the kids in your book here at Stanford and all over the U.S. at, at some of the top universities. We're seeing these kids who, who really did school instead of um, learned how to engage deeply in school and what can we do to change that. And that's what started uh, Challenge Success, which is what you just put up on the screen. So uh, the book was published, uh, at least the copy I have was in 2001. Was that its initial publication date? Yes. And you came to my attention because of Vicki Abelli's and Race to Nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and we had Vicki on the show, and of course I watched the movie and saw you and thought, oh, <laughs> that's, I immediately emailed you. Oh. Um, aside from Race to Nowhere, um, in what kind of a response have you gotten to the book? Well, I, you know, it was really sort of overwhelming at first. I would get a lot of emails from kids saying, this is my high school. I know this is my high school. And, you know, at Stanford, we're not allowed to reveal the name of the students, the real names of the students or the real names of the school. Um, and so many kids and actually other educators were convinced that this was their high school. So that led me to believe, you know, I did hit a nerve here. This isn't just five kids in Silicon Valley. And then I started to get emails from other countries, Singapore and India, saying, you know, you're describing our lives. So that's what sort of led me, and also the prompting from the mental health folks at Stanford led me to think about we, we need really to create an intervention here. We need to do something about this, um, which in part we helped advise on the movie Race to Nowhere, but, but we work very closely with about 100 schools around the country right now. And we also do parent and student education to help them really think about how are they defining success in school um, and success in life, for that matter, and what sacrifices are they making to their health and well-being, and also what sacrifices are they making academically um, when, when you are this stressed out or busy or, or or not engaged at all, which is another way of doing school, what happens you know, to our future workers, to our future citizens? So I wanted to put the students that you chose within a mental construct for myself as it related to Cal Newport's book. 
and here's how I did it, and I'm, I'm wondering if I did it correctly. So he took students who had actually already been accepted at premier schools, who he called, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the term now. It was, um, it was a phrase he used for their kind of relaxed accomplishments. Yeah. And but using the measure of having gotten to where they wanted to in life, he looked back and determined that these were students who um, weren't in the category of the students that you're describing. And again, this is my interpretation. And you've chosen you chose students based on the teachers and administrators' descriptions of them as being successful students. To what degree is the overlap, or are are you were you actually looking at sort of separate kinds of students? That's a really good question. I, I think Cal would say that we were looking at really separate kinds of students. What he was looking for is sort of are there kids who can do this, who can sort of survive the crazy intense high school years and get into the elite colleges without, to use a phrase from the Harvard admissions dean, mortgaging their adolescence. So he was looking for the ones who had sort of the right kind of motivation, typically intrinsic, although some, not always, who had some sense of balance and could look back and say, here's how I did it. Um, and that's definitely not the case with the students that I um, researched in the book. So I, I think that's probably that was my sense as well. And um, do you think Cal Cal's going directly to the students? His feeling is that this isn't he just not interested in education reform. He's not interested in much else. He just wants to speak to those students about what they can do. Um, is there a degree to which he's doing maybe the only thing that can really be done for them? You mean it being a voice for them in his book? Well, yeah. Well, I've, I'll, I'm going to hold that if it's okay. I was I was sort of going to go down this path of, of reform and kind of change. Uh, my impression was that Cal was saying, you know, we're not going to change the system dramatically. I'm I'm going to look at the individual students. I think you're going to go more broadly than that. But let's save it if we can. That's uh, right. A yeah. Bit yeah. Later. Okay. So tell us about the. You started to tell us, but tell us more about the title of the book and what kids, the, the kids you were looking at, were doing when they were doing school. So let's take Kevin, who's one one of my absolute favorites. Um, Kevin had uh, he was sort of the kiss up Eddie Haskell type kid in the school. He would ask the French teacher, you know, how was your weekend, and he would schmooze people, and the teachers just loved him. And I see him raising his hand in class and, and being really sort of animated. So after class, which is when I typically would interview them, I would say, hey, you look like you were kind of interested and maybe even engaged in that class. You know, tell me about that. And that's where he just threw this line at me. You know, people don't go to school to learn. They go to get good grades, which brings them to college, which brings them a high-paying job, which brings them to happiness, or so they think. But it's not about learning. It's really doing school. And um, he said, I didn't know the answers to those questions. I just have a rule that I raise my hand every five to seven minutes so that the teacher thinks that I'm on task. And if we look at engagement as just behavioral engagement, we got a lot of kids who are doing school who look like they're taking notes or listening or raising their hand even and paying attention, but in reality they're just playing this big game um, of getting through the really crazy hectic day, kind of you know, copying homework from friends, cheating rampantly um, to get the grades by hook or by crook to get to the next level. So, I think what, what, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so I mean, that was sort of the first sign that I had to rethink what I believed was engagement. Because usually as a teacher, if everybody's kind of looking at you and paying attention and taking notes, you think that they're with you. And that's not necessarily the case. I think for me part of the sadness of the book was realizing that these kids who had learned to play the games um, 
are, they aren't the normal student, I'm guessing. And, and even uh, Berto doesn't do that. And, and you described sort of how he doesn't get some options in his life because of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what, how, how many students would you estimate understand the game well enough to play it as well as the kids that, that you were following? That is a great question. I, I have been asked that question before, and I, at first I would say I have no idea. But now I can tell you, because we, we've done a survey now of 10,000 kids at 24 different high-achieving schools, okay, so public and private, 180 questions. And I can tell you at high achieving schools, and usually the way that we define that is a, a very large percentage going on to four year colleges, um, I would say we have 50 to 75 percent of the kids who admit to doing school, whether that means cheating on a, on a regular basis. In fact, in our sample, there's only 10 percent of the kids who don't cheat. Um, on a regular basis, whether that's being completely sleep deprived, whether that's doing three hours or more of homework a night. So we're not talking about um, uh, sort of a, a low achieving kid um, in a school that that maybe graduates 20 percent to to four year colleges. But in in the in the schools that I study, and believe me, there's a lot of these across the country, both private and public. I'd say the majority of the kids are doing school or they're opting out completely because they look at the system and they say, not me, that's not working. What we've then found is kids in the not so high achieving schools are also doing school. Their stress looks a little different, but it's the same thing. They're either very stressed about how will they pay for college, what is college, or how do they pay for an advanced placement test if such a thing exists at their school, or how do they pass the high school exit exam. Um, but their stress levels are as high as the kids who are taking five or six APs. So that was surprising to me. I thought we were talking about just really the high achieving kids at the high achieving schools. And what we're finding is we've got sleep deprived kids, we've got kids who feel the stress and pressure, who are, it's taking a toll on their uh, psyche, it's taking a toll on their uh, physical well-being at um, at schools all over the country. So you make a connection in the book that I felt um, strongly in Race to Nowhere as well. But let's springboard off of that because I think you're also saying, guess what? This isn't just the students. This is also the teachers. Yeah. And when you really get down to it, this is actually our culture. Yeah that in part these schools are actually reflecting what we do culturally. So how, why would we expect them to be any different? Well, I think, you know, and some people, the cynics out there say, you know, that sort of kissing up, passing the buck, cheating your way through, getting the grades by hook or by crook, those are the leaders, you know, out there right now. Now, I, I refuse to believe that. That's not why I got into education. That's not why I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of your listeners got into education. Um, it, you know, I think the culture right now is 24-7, go, 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 um, push, push, push. I think the difference what we're seeing is the CEOs, and remember I'm in Silicon Valley, so, it, you know, we, we talked to a bunch of CEOs who say to us, look, we're getting kids out of these elite schools, these elite business schools, um, they don't know how to think out of the box. They don't know how to collaborate. They don't know how to, you know, play nice with others. Um, we don't want the driven robo students. We, you know, exactly what Lori just said. Critical thinking and ethics are are missing. And what they say is, we can't teach that. We can teach business skills. We can't teach creativity, passion, out of the box kind of thinking. So, uh, you know, it may be that our culture is one way, and why would we expect the kids to be differently, but it's getting us in trouble. There are so many ways that we could go here, uh, and I don't want us to get too far off track, but what, you know, what occurs to me is that in a lot of ways there have been schools that have provided that, uh, you know, especially sort of elite 
uh, types of schools that lead to, to sort of more leadership roles. You, you make a connection in the book, though, that I've been wondering about for a long time, which is we've got schools that seem to do a better job, um, whether they're progressive schools or they're democratic schools or whatever you want to call them. There are a lot of schools that have uh, probably done a very good job of being more engaging for the students. Right. And the question has been, why don't they spread more? And in the book you talk about, I get the sense from the book that it's really hard in this current system, though, for those to feed into the, sort of the college mechanisms that are required for sort of traditional opportunities. Right. Well, that and we've got high stakes tests that define, you know, you're very limited as a teacher if you try to do um, progressive teaching uh, in a school where you're told you must teach to the test. So I think you've got colleges on the one hand as a pressure point, and they admit it. Um, you've got No Child Left Behind and the, and the new sort of you know national standards movement. We're going to jury's out on that, but my guess is there's a lot of handcuffs here, and. We're also stuck in a system, and this is kind of goes back to the Mary Metz, Larry Cuban concept, where people think of school as being one way. They think of school as going to classes, taking tests, doing homework, you know, getting grades. And the really progressive schools don't look anything like that anymore. And that's very hard to convince a whole bunch of folks to believe that they are um, they're better. <laughs> I mean, I'll be, I'm biased, but, but that, that they're actually doing more for their kids in the long run than the very traditional models of schooling. So now let's swing back and bring Cal back into the discussion. Because in the book you say uh, there needs to be a new vision of what it is to be successful in school and life. And I hear you saying we need to figure out ways to bring the students' voices into this process. So how do we think about change, and what have you done at Challenge Success to think about how you make those changes? So I'm I'm a student of Larry Cuban and David Tyak, who 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 believe in uh, tinkering towards utopia, sort of school by school, district by district change model. And so what we do in order to ensure that there's student voice, and I think that's absolutely critical when you're talking about school change, is we require schools to send a team. Everybody is part of the problem. Everybody's got to be part of the solution. So they send a principal, a counselor, a teacher, a parent, and at least two students. And we walk them through what's going on at your school, what are the symptoms that you see of the problem, and what are the root causes. And we help them come up with an action plan, a very site-specific action plan. Um, there, it's not a one-size-fits-all model that doesn't work, in my opinion, in terms of school reform. And they've got to have all stakeholders buying in. And it's amazing, you know, the teachers will say and the, and the administrators will say, well, we want a really short lunch period because that's where you lose kids. That's where sort of bad behavior happens. And the kids will say, we can't even make it through the cafeteria line in 25 minutes. What if we and we can't meet with teachers when we need to meet with them and have conferences or discuss things? That lunch period is absolutely critical. So you have really the kids kind of saying, "We live this every day. You've got to listen to us when you think about a change model, whether that's for the schedule or the academic integrity, uh, honesty policy, or uh, the homework policy. Any kind of policy and practice changes that they're envisioning." The parents, the kids, the teachers, the administrators, everybody gets to weigh in on uh, what that vision should be. So that feels like a really healthy model for how you would negotiate any kind of cultural institution. Um, is, uh, um, why is it we don't do that more? Well, first of all, it's really hard. Um, it's sort of a one-on-one uh, one -on -one consulting kind of model. So it doesn't scale very easily, right? So my colleagues at Stanford, Linda Darling Hammond, and they, they study national reform. You know, we work with a hundred schools right now. You know, obviously that's going to grow, but we're sort of maxed out at a certain point. 
with this individual consulting model. On the other hand, I don't really think um, real change, I mean, if you look at the history of school reform over the ages, real change, it's, it, it's very hard to change a school culture. It's very hard to change um, teacher behavior um, when there's not buy-in from all the stakeholders, when there's not a shared vision, um, when there's not a, a very collaborative and supportive environment to do that. So Larry's been on the show a couple of times, and there's, there's this intriguing question of, are there policy implications that would lead toward that kind of activity? I mean, I know yeah. you're working not very much on the local level, but does it, does it, <coughs> do you then end up coming to some conclusions about policy based on the need for that kind of local engagement? Yes, I mean, I, so I am a fan of more local control, right? And so is Larry. Um, so, so here's the problem. In some schools, I would say, you know, this, this, the fact that there is accountability now um, is probably a good thing because there are some really, really bad schools out there that needed somebody from higher to come down and say, okay, accountability. But for the majority of, of, of schools out there, um, I do believe in, 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 in more of a local control, community-based uh, reform system, um, for better or for worse. But I think that we see that the, 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 the big top-down policies don't necessarily do much. They kind of, to borrow a line from Larry, it's just, changing the, uh, you know, lawn furniture on the deck of the Titanic. So what we found, and, and this was surprising to me, because I didn't know how well our system was going to work. We have a, a pretty good system, uh, a pretty good track record of having schools make changes and sustaining them. Um, whether that is a huge schedule change, whether that's putting finals before break so kids actually get a break, whether that's really rethinking the homework policy, whether that's um, exploring alternative assessments. So there's a lot of changes that, that normally I don't think you'd see happen maybe as quickly that we are able to get through and see sustained, I think, because of this consulting model. I was clapping on the I saw that. Break. That's <laughs> always been my, you know, of, of the things that I care about, you know, one of which is the loss of family time because of homework. Yeah. The other is struggling through a vacation with finals after the vacation. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's sort of a no-brainer. Now, I will say this. Palo Alto Unified, it took us four years, but they finally just voted. Um, but it was it was getting kind of nasty. I mean, I was considered the the lady who, who ruined Christmas. There's... You know, there's so much fear out there, right? There's fear-based parenting, there's fear-based teaching. And because we didn't have a, a gold standard study with a pre and a post of a school, we've, we've helped at least 20 schools now move to finals before break. The folks at Palo Alto, and, and it's hard, it's hard. It's a big district, it's a K-12 district. They, they were very worried. And there were parents who were just still extremely worried. How is this going to affect my child? And what they don't realize is you need to have downtime. You need to have family time. We have a mnemonic aid at Challenge Success called PDF. It doesn't stand for Portable Document Format. I, you know that, Steve, because I am so not a techie. It stands for Playtime, Downtime, Family Time. This is research-based, right? We know from research that every kid needs PDF every day. And you cannot have family time when your kids are locked in their rooms doing their homework. You cannot have downtime. They can't get the proper sleep. You can't have family vacation when your kid has to study for finals. And we all need downtime and family time and playtime, adults too. But kids developmentally need it even more than we do. I don't know what role you had to play in the movie, and maybe you'll tell us. But one of the things I really appreciated about Race from Nowhere was showing Vicky's family together at dinner, and um, because that's been sort of one of the things that we really try to do as a family is to really preserve that time. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's, if you look at the huge, huge Michigan study, and it's been um, replicated several times, and this is on our website. All this research they can find on our website. Um, and someone just asked the origins of PDF. You can just cite me. Um, I, I sort of created that mnemonic aid. But the research shows that the families who eat dinner together, and it's, it's nothing magical about the pizza or the chicken or the you know, Chinese food. It's the 25 minutes together on a daily basis five times a week. That's the research. You don't have to do it. You can start slowly and build up. But those kids are the ones who get higher grades. Those kids are the ones who are less likely to become pregnant, less likely to end up uh, in jail, um, more likely to uh, earn a living that you know sustains themselves outside of school. It's the closest thing we have to a magic bullet, if you want to say that. It's it's what's known as a protective factor. So. That's huge from a family standpoint. The equivalent to that in school, the thing that leads to kids feeling uh, that they belong in school, higher motivation, higher grades, etc., is engagement. So we really have two main goals at Challenge Success. One is to make sure that parents and kids understand the developmental needs of kids and that they understand the need for playtime and sleep and, and family time, and that educators can build in that same concept really of PDF in their classroom. There needs to be kid uh, free voice and choice. That's the equivalent of play. There needs to be some downtime. They can't be going 24-7. You know, you need to sort of space out your units and have the up and downs and have the breaks. And there needs to be a sense of community, if not family, in the schools, whether that's done through advisory, whether that's done through um, uh, greater um, teacher-student interaction. So it, it, it really does make a difference to how, how engaged they are in learning if they feel that they belong and are cared for and there's a perspective that um, their teachers know them and want to help them. As I read the book, I actually uh, kind of thought in my mind that in some ways you fulfilled that role for those students that you were spending time with. <laughs> did, you, did you think about the degree to which your involvement might actually change their uh, experience? Yeah, you know what was so surprising to me? That it's, it's good. because when I, when I was doing the research, I didn't have kids. I was actually pregnant with my oldest child. And I was shocked at how many times these kids would call or send me an email even when it wasn't um, my day to shadow them. And I realized they they were kind of relying on our interaction, and they saw it as a positive thing, which you know was great for me as a researcher um, because we were building trust and rapport. But more so, um, you know, I I know I affected um, Teresa. Um, you know, I, she switched programs, and I don't think she would have done that if I hadn't have done the research. I mean, from a, a, a typical research standpoint, you try not to have that effect. From a qualitative research standpoint, that's exactly the effect you want. Yeah, I, I wasn't familiar with advisories until um, last year when I did an interview and that came up and it, it sort of not, continues to gnaw at me as such a great thing. And, um, and that's what I sort of saw you doing in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were sort of our own little advisory. That, that's actually good. I've never thought about it that way, but that's, that's about right. So there's a, there are a lot of people getting involved in education now. Uh, it's a, it's a, obviously sort of a hot topic. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies in Silicon Valley and, and VC firms talking about you know, dramatically changing education. We've got national reform programs. Um, how healthy is that? Is it? Uh, what are the positives and negatives? And are there things that we should be thinking about? to help move those kinds of activities in the most positive directions possible? That's a good question. Uh, you know, you can't be against innovation. I, I think it's great that there are schools that are taking risks, that are trying new things. Um, it's very interesting. At graduation, a colleague of mine looked at me and she said, you know, I don't have as many students who want to start schools this year. Usually every year, in the master's or PhD program at Stanford, we have a bunch of students who say, yeah, next year I'm going to start a school. And this year, for whatever reason, there weren't as many, probably a sign of the economy. 
But I'm hoping that we don't lose that innovative spark. And what I like to see is, um, you know, some of these innovations are are doing great things for kids. What I worry about is when you try to scale it up. And I'll, I'll take Kip as an example. You know, do you know you know the Kip schools? Right. We do. There are some fabulous Kip schools out there. Fabulous that are changing kids' lives in a very positive way. There are some ones that are not so great. So did they scale up too fast? What is it about the KIPP program that works that, you know, isn't working in a different setting with a different group of kids? How much of it can be attributed to the teacher versus the curriculum versus the structure? So many questions. Um, so it goes back to sort of this, you know, not one size fits all kind of thinking. Um, and and really the community and a community-based school and what works for one community may not work for another. Um, and this, this drives researchers crazy, right, because you want to find something that works and you want it to apply across the country to solve the problem. And I'm just not convinced that we can do that easily, so I'm glad to see lots of different models. There's not one way to do school right. Um, and there was so much that we're learning now in terms of neurology. I know I'm kind of taking this left turn here, but you know, we know that kids learn in so many different ways. We know so much more about uh, differentiating um, teaching styles to meet the different needs of the learners. We have to do that not just on a school by school basis, but also in a classroom by classroom basis. So I have a friend who is involved in, um, at some level, with the sort of the Silicon Valley venture finance models and these companies that are that are getting funded to do work in schools. And her comment to me was that she's never seen a group of investors who knew so little about what they were actually working on. Yeah. So um, have, have you seen that as well? And um, okay, about it. You want to, I don't want to put you at a, at a corner no, no, ball, no, but are you no, willing to talk about that? This is the problem. This is the problem. And and some of them are, are getting much better. I would say probably in the last five to seven years, I've seen more of them admitting, gosh, we need to talk to experts in education. We thought it was just throw money at the problem or run a school like a business. And they're finding that that's not working. So... I am seeing more of the kids who I work with, the, the, the graduates from Stanford, get employed as you know chief academic officer at Charter School X, or um, you know it, they're they're starting to to turn more and realize that they need educators and they need to listen to and talk to and and uh, engage people who really know what they're doing. Um, so that's I, I'm encouraged by that. I um, am always discouraged when I see a quote in, you know, a paper that says um, the mayor's office is going to take over the school district or uh, businessman X is going to take over the school district because I worry that they're going to try and apply uh, business models which don't necessarily work um, when you're talking about, you know, a seven-year-old kid. Um, so I'm, again, very biased in this way, but I believe... Um, I believe you, you, you got to talk to the educators. So we're going to shift to Q and A. If you've put a question in the chat and I've missed it, I apologize. I'm not great at the multitasking, so you're welcome to post it again or raise your hand. That's using the hand or the green up arrow, the icon at the bottom of your participant window to raise your hand, and we'll give you the microphone, and you can ask Denise a question. Um, And tell us, Becky, there's a question or not. Aren't we already using a business model mass producing workers and all? Um, uh, I'll, I'll ask one very quickly as we wait for some to come in. There, you use a statistic in the book that 74% uh, of the freshmen had a goal of being very well off financially versus in 1967, 82% had as a goal to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. Yeah, that's the Aston it's, study, huge, huge study, yeah. So does that really reflect the reality of a of a larger change 
um, or is it just one more sort of piece that's kept schools um, in, a, in a model that uh, for as long as they've been in that model? No, I think it does represent a change. I mean, we, this is my co-founders and I were just talking about this the other day. This it, this fear that we're seeing that the reason why everything's sort of ratcheted up at the um, elite levels and then even ratcheting up. I mean, sort of now every kid has to go to college. I mean, not every kid um, should go to college, and I, I don't mean that in a way that's saying you know we should have a caste system here of workers versus intellectuals, but for some kids, that's just not what they want to do, and that's not where they're going to be successful. Everything gets ratcheted up. Everybody's now got to take uh, uh, algebra in eighth grade, right? Part of what this ratcheting up that we're seeing is we are living in a very different economic time. And it used to be that you kind of made your way through high school, and if you were college bound, you kind of knew, at least in California, you'd get into a UC somewhere. And if you wanted to do a different path, maybe you would try for an elite school or maybe you would try for um, a different post-secondary experience like a trade school. And it was okay. Now, um, with the economy the way it is and certainly in, in the global uh, schema, there's a, uh, the fear is real that your kid may not make it into a UC. And what does that mean? And you may need to have a certain skill set, or you won't be better off than your parents. Um, and that that is a very real possibility, and that's leading people to do crazy things, like sleep out for three days to get their kid into a preschool, um, as if you know that matters, um, or to hire millions of tutors to prop up their child and, and sort of lead them in a direction that really um, is sending a message of you can't do anything by yourself anymore. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. I, I, I think it's a cultural issue. It's an economic issue of the time right now that the kids who take that freshman survey every year are answering questions in that way. Greg wants to know, what changes do students recommend that we make? Oh gosh, they have so many. The coolest thing about our survey, remember 10,000 kids, is we ask them, what if anything would you recommend your school do to relieve your stress and um, uh, increase your engagement with learning? We don't ask it quite that way. Everything the kids say. I mean, you, you think that you would get like change the, the food in the cafeteria? No way. Everything the kids say is research-based. It's like, of course, they know it. We don't even need to do the research on it. They say teachers should work together so that we don't have three tests on one day. <coughs> they say, <coughs> sorry, <Steve. coughs> this is the allergies. <coughs> they say, um, you know, we have too much homework. We can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to take some water. I'm so sorry. Mm. <coughs> they say um, classes are deathly boring. <coughs> Can we do hands-on activities? Can we have discussions? Can we have debates? Can we do simulations? Anything besides lecture. <coughs> Ooh, I'm so sorry. And And the deal is, we know from research that that leads to better learning. So they, the kids know it. Yeah, there's such a sense in the book that the students really want authentic learning. They, in fact, the, the you know the sadness of the Kevin story was the you know, the pen pals piece, and the, the, they they really want to be working on things they care about, but they feel that they can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. You know, they want to be challenged. I think that at first you might get some resistance. We, um, we're we very surprised when we have kids say, just give us a test. It's so much easier. Give us the right and wrong answer. <laughs> but when you push them, they do want to be challenged. They want to be engaged. They're in school for such a long time. And I really do urge the educators out there to shadow kids like I did. It's 
so eye-opening to see how hard it is to go to school for a whole day, to go from class to class and listen and be attentive and do the work and then get home and have to do more work and you have everybody pulling on you. Um, and then outside of school, you've got the coaches and the tutors and the music teachers and the parents and everybody's kind of putting all this pressure on you. It's really hard. So the shadowing, I think, at least opened my eyes to you know what I thought was was pretty good teaching practice that I was doing. I realized, oh my God, I had no idea what these kids were going through before and after they came to my class. Have we reached a place where where there really might be a higher ed bubble, um, or is the value of higher education being questioned and the cost of it high enough that we might actually see kind of a larger cultural shift away from our views of higher ed right now? I think we're just starting to see that. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, what I'm worried about is Historically, you've got the Latino population and the African American population and certainly the Native American population as well. Historically, what I'm worried about is there are um, a bunch of kids out there who are not reaching their potential because they're not being given that option. And the reverse is we're pushing a bunch of kids to do stuff that maybe isn't as worth it. I mean, I know there's the, the grand experiment going on that the guy who's paying uh, college students to drop out of college and be innovative and they'll get $100,000. Do, know, do you know what I'm talking about? I do, the PayPal guy. Yeah. Teal. I mean, I worry about that. I think there's, I think developmentally, I think there's an importance to a post-secondary education of some kind. Certainly we know economically there is. Um, uh, for the you know he's talking about a few innovators that may go off and you know start the next Facebook, but in reality most people don't do that, and there's some real benefits to um, being socialized in the way that a lot of kids are in a post secondary institution. So I do I do worry about that. On the other hand, um, this sort of college for all, everybody's got to take all these classes to meet all these requirements, otherwise you don't pass. Um, and you don't get a degree, that's also not the right answer. You know, I had Dale, uh, the Dale Stevens on, uh, the uncollege guy, and it was very interesting because it became very clear in the interview, he's really an autodidact. Yeah. And it's hard to, it's hard to imagine him being representative of most people. That's right. That's right. I agree. Although it's somewhere in this chat, I, I saw you know we are all oh, it's Becky. We are all natural learners, and school is shutting it off. I would agree with that too. There's things that the schools are doing, consciously or unconsciously. There's things that we do as teachers, consciously or unconsciously, that actually say, don't think out of the box, don't take a risk. It's far better to be safer and get the grade, um, and play you know sort of match game with what the teacher wants. The ones who are really different. Look at Michelle who wanted to write a novel. And the English teacher says, I don't know what to do with that. Well, I can't give you credit for that. I understand the English teacher's position, but you have a kid who wants to write a novel. I mean, there's no way we can find it in our system to support that? So Jeff uh, asks, says, Denise, a little off topic, but do you see a difference in schools that implement zero tolerance policies random drug testing, drug sniffing dogs, or the existence of on-campus mental health counselors? That's really interesting. I don't know of any studies that look at that, but I will say this. What we know, it goes back to Desi Ryan's uh, research, a kid has to feel like they belong, that they're cared for, in order to do any kind of learning. That's sort of the basic, you need to feel safe. And if you are in an environment where there's no trust, where there's uh, sort of a us versus them. I think someone earlier said it's like a jail. You know, it's really hard to be excited about going there every day. It's really hard to be able to take a risk and um, put yourself out on a limb and ask a question and show that you don't know something. Um, Jeff said, okay, so it's Desi, D-E-C-I, and Ryan, R-Y-A-N, two different researchers. It's really important. This is, this is all the stuff about social and emotional learning. 
um, which really is going to be, it already is pretty hot. It's going to get hotter and hotter. It's the thing that drives advisories in high school. It's the thing that drives um, the kind of really good learning going on in the elementary schools as well. And if you want some good resources on that, you can look up CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. They have a wonderful website on that. But the, the truth of the matter is when you're drug tested and you've got the sniffing dogs and you have the metal detectors, I understand that some of this is for the kids' protection. That's a whole different way of teaching and learning than I believe in. Denise, have you looked at democratic schools at all? I know of some. Yeah, I, I, I really like them. It, that, again, is hard to do on a, on a large scale basis. What about homeschooling and unschooling? Well, I'm not against homeschooling. Um, for for many people, this is sort of the survival tactic for the kid. You know, the kid says, "Get me out of here," and uh, I appreciate that. You know, as a mom with three kids, there's no way that I could do, I could do it. What I like about homeschooling now, what what used to be the problem with homeschooling is that there really wasn't a social outlet for the kids and. And you know developmentally they need to be around other kids. They're, they're similar. Um, they don't have to be the same age, but similar uh, to sort of push them from a peer level, not just an adult to, to child level. Now you have homeschooling networks all over the U.S. that really um, serve that need. So I'm not against homeschooling. I think for some kids it's absolutely the way to go. Um, I don't think that's a large-scale um, Solution. I think same with unschooling. And again, you just have to be really careful here. I mean, um, you know, even some of the very progressive schools in the 60s, uh, where you would just let the kids do whatever they want, and really they were doing a whole lot of nothing. That's not good. Um, it goes back to John Dewey and and really finding that balance as the adult of. Um, student choice and voice and allowing them to have a say and certainly meeting their needs and and letting them drive, uh, but within a prescribed track. <coughs> so having said that, we, we had um, Robert Epstein on the show who wrote a book called Teen 2.0. And his argument is that um, we, we give, we constrain youth from having substantive choices way too long. I agree. How would you respond to that? I agree. I agree. And here's the thing. We see kids at Stanford, this is a true story, they don't know how to solve little problems. Like they don't know where their class is on the first day of school. They're calling their mom three time zones away to help them. That is not going to fly. When you get to college, you ought to be prepared to do your own laundry, to um, advocate for yourself with the professor. We have parents calling professors when, uh, to contest grades. Um, so what happens is we, we – this is kind of from Wendy Mogul's stuff. Again, her, her book's on our website. We bubble wrap kids way too early, and we take over and make their choices for them. And that goes to the helicopter parenting and – you know, right now you've got to start young, and this comes through in our, we have a six-week parent class that we're putting online. Right now we just do it live, but in the fall it will be online. And we actually teach parents how to let go and how to, you know, when is it appropriate to let your kid uh, walk down the street to a friend's house alone, you know, which we, we all used to do. Um, but if we don't let them make their own decisions, take risks, it turns out that they're not resilient and they end up in the health center when they go to college. Here's time for one final question. Mackie F. says, do you know of good models of project-based learning schools that foster creativity, student engagement, collaboration, et cetera? Yes. I'm going to send you to a couple of websites because that's going to be easier. But Coalition for Essential Schools, Edutopia, um, these all have they're, they're, they're places where teachers can share lessons, project-based learning, project-based lessons um, online. We actually work with schools to do some workshops around how to do that and how to build in alternative assessments along with that. It's, it's much harder to assess 
project-based learning, but in the long run, that's exactly the kind of thing you want to do in the classroom. Denise, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for coming. I'm clapping for you. I've clapped <laughs> several times. It's really fun to have you on. I really appreciate your perspective. I'm really delighted to have made acquaintance with you, and, um, and thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. It's been it's been so much fun. And definitely say hi to your dad for me. That's exciting. <laughs> <I> <laughs> he doesn't know. know me. I'm one of the millions, but I certainly know him. So he That's probably great. he probably still remembers your test scores. He probably yeah, probably kind of he is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Denise. Thanks everybody for coming. And don't forget, uh, beginning of July, Sandy Hirsch comes on to talk about libraries and digital literacy, and of course the new. Uh, virtual Library Conference November 2nd and 3rd that she and I are um, uh, co-chairing. Uh, lots more fun ahead. Thanks for spending your time with us, and thanks again to Denise. Most appreciated. Have a great night, everybody. Take care. <laughs>